Cosby was arrested in 2015, two years later. The New York Times would publish a story detailing decades of allegations of sexual harassment and assault against Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein. He would later be found guilty of sexual assault in 2020. And I'm joined now by Louise Godbold. She is one of the 90 women who have come forward with claims against Weinstein. And she has also been helping other women, victims of trauma ever since. Louise, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, the reaction today was swift uh, from many of the victims of Bill Cosby. Um, Andrea Constan, for one, uh, who he is convicted of raping, said that she is disappointed and discouraged that other survivors of sexual assault uh, may not come forward. Your reaction to today's news? Well, first of all, my rule is I never speak for a survivor when they can speak for themselves. But I think a lot of the Cosby survivors are finding it really difficult to come to terms with what happened today. And so we're willing to come on camera. My other feeling is of great empathy. I can't imagine. They came forward at a time when victims' voices were rarely heard. And Cosby was absolutely banking on his popularity. And despite that, despite going against all the odds to have that conviction overturned and for him to be released must be absolutely gutting for them. We have seen the momentum of the Me Too movement grow since these cases and others in recent years. So what impact does a decision like this from a high court in Pennsylvania have on those voices, those victims who are out there who may be afraid to come forward? I think this says a lot about our legal system. If uh, if this is how the legal system treats survivors, then it's not fit for purpose. If there were a hospital that were killing its patients, you would put it out of action. Um, I think it's particularly worrying for those of us involved in the Weinstein trials, because although the argument about the um, prior bad act witnesses was not actually ruled upon. There was a lot of sympathy expressed by the justices for uh, the inclusion of the prior bad acts witnesses. And as you know, Harvey's trial in New York depended a lot upon the testimony of people beyond the statute of limitations. And I wonder how this is going to impact the DA's strategy for the LA trial. In the journey for justice for so many, uh, in your particular case, uh, when you get a conviction, when you see your accuser go to jail for what they did, uh, what impact does that have on you as the victim in alleviating any, if at all, the trauma that you have experienced? Does it give you some sort of closure? I think what it does more than anything else is make you feel like you matter, especially when these men are powerful and wealthy, have morally corrupt lawyers who are more than willing to do their bidding. And the, the ruling today just blew my mind, talking about the uh, affront to fundamental fairness, talking in terms of decency and fair play. That should be considered when you look at the survivors, not the abuser. We are the ones who didn't get justice or fair play. And certainly now the Cosby survivors have not. I'm just hopeful that in LA that we continue to be able to bring these charges against Harvey and see him die in jail. I mean, I think that's the only appropriate thing for the harm that he's caused. And as for this whole male fragility, you know, Harvey appearing on his walker and now Cosby supposedly legally blind. Well, actually, you know, without my glasses, I'm legally blind. So I don't take uh, much stock in that. What about the fragility and the vulnerability of the victims? Nothing is focused on the victims. It's all focused on the perpetrators. Well, I know you continue to advocate for victims and making sure that they know out there whether they have spoken out or not that their voices matter and will be heard. Louise Godbold, thank you. Thank you.